Welcome everybody to the uh, webcast series, The Public Health Insider. My name is Casey Farm, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. This is our third and final webcast of the fourth season of the Public Health Insider series. You can watch or rewatch any of the previous 11 episodes from any season at osualum.com slash public health webcasts. Uh, I am delighted to introduce our moderator for today, uh, for today's episode, Healthy Back Home. Uh, but first, we have a couple of logistical items for you. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will find a Q&A chat button. Uh, you're welcome to type questions throughout the talk at any point in time, and at the end of the presentation, our panelists will answer as many as that they can before the end of the episode. Our webcast series is hosted by the OSU Alumni Association in collaboration with the OSU Foundation, the College of Public Health and Human Sciences, and the OSU Center for Health Innovation. We love having this series here for you in its fourth iteration, Surrounding Public Health and Human Sciences, what it is, why it's important, and how it applies to our lives and to our communities. For more information on public health and the rest of the incredible work being done in and around the college, please visit health.oregonstate.edu. Now on to today's moderator who will introduce today's topic and our panelists. Our series moderator for the 12th time uh, is Dr. Allison Myers. She is the director of the OSU Center for Health Innovation within the college. Uh, the center serves as a connector between external organizations and Oregon State University faculty in the discovery of innovative solutions to pressing health and wellness issues and builds workforce capacity in public health and human sciences. In service to meeting the most pressing public health needs in the state of Oregon, the center is home to projects related to the COVID-19 response, including Trace OSU and Trace Community, mental health promotion and substance use prevention in rural Oregon, and improving food security for the Oregon Health Plan members through store-based changes. It is absolutely my pleasure to introduce and welcome back and turn the webcast over to Dr. Allison Myers. Welcome, Dr. Myers. Glad to have you back. Thanks so much, Casey. I can't believe this is our 12th uh, public I health. Know, 12th time. And one of the first things I do is to always check the participant list because there are so many of you who, who keep coming back and who have actually made this made um, this series a part of your um, month, like the way that you spend your time. Um, today's episode is called "Healthy Back Home." Uh, you all remember more than a year ago, many of us very quickly transitioned uh, to working from home at the start of the pandemic. Some of us moved from the couch to homemade office spaces in response to neck pain and achy backs. I know I have picked up my chair, my computer, lots of things from my real office to get more comfortable here at home. And because remote work is here to stay in one form or another, I know many of you are wondering how we ensure our workplace supports our physical health. How often do we consider health and safety hazards at home? Today, we have Jay Kim and Laurel Kinsel to help us discuss the importance of ergonomics and how the lessons learned from typ typically hazardous occupations uh, can improve our health and well being. I am going to ask Laurel and Jay to turn on your cameras. I'm going to introduce both of you uh, and then turn it over to you all for about a half an hour talk. Uh, at which time we'll gather up all of your questions from those of you that are in the audience. We'd love to hear from you, what you're thinking, what kinds of detailed questions you have for our speakers. Uh, so first up is a talk. Well, first up is introductions uh, and then a talk and then a Q&A. That's the run of the show for today. All right, are we ready? Uh, first, um, let me introduce Dr. Jay Kim. Uh, now an associate professor or moving in that direction very quickly. Congratulations on your promotion and tenure. Uh, Dr. Kim is an assistant associate professor in the OSU College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Uh, Dr. Kim received his master's degree in industrial and systems engineering from the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and, uh, and a PhD in ergonomics and biomechanics from the University of Washington. And before you joined OSU's faculty in 2015, you were an assistant professor at Northern Illinois University and a research scientist at the University of Washington. Uh, Jay, Dr. Kim, we're so glad that you're here. Thanks so much for being here. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Laurel Kinsel. 
uh, an associate professor in our College of Public Health and Human Sciences. And Dr. Kinsel, you received your master's degree in industrial hygiene and PhD in occupational safety and ergonomics from the University of Cincinnati. And before you joined Oregon State in 2011, you were a research fellow at the Center for Research in Environmental Epidemiology in Barcelona, Spain, and a research associate at the Labor Education and Research Center at the University of Oregon, just down the road from 2003 to 2009. We are so glad uh, to have you. This is a really important topic, one I can admit to knowing virtually nothing about and having lots of silly questions that maybe, maybe we'll have time for about how to stand and sit appropriately and all of the things at home. So with that, I am going to mute myself and hide, and I'm going to turn it over to you all. Thank you so much. Um, that's a lovely introduction, and we're very excited to be here and be part of this Public Health Insider. And hopefully, um, Jay and I can share some of our expertise in ergonomics. Um, we do typically work in occupational settings, and as Allison has said, um, many of our workplaces and homes have become merged. But in addition to what you might be working at home, there's many things um, that you might be exposed to uh, that relate to your musculoskeletal health, which is what we're going to kind of go into um, to give you the fuller background um, of basically ergonomics. So just so we're all on the same page about what ergonomics is, um, we define it as um, how we shape uh, people working in a or doing any activity within a task that you're doing, the tools and equipment that is related to what you're doing, and then the environment for which you're working in. And the goal is not to fit us to those, but rather to fit the task, the environment, and the tools to us um, to create optimal health and well-being. So that's kind of the, the basics of what ergonomics is. Just because we do work in occupational settings, we thought we'd share just a little bit of background of what they track um, around musculoskeletal health, which is what ergonomics addresses. And so here you can see on the left are the rate of workers um, that are injured. And at the top of that list, you can see firefighters, emergency medical technicians, um, um, reservation agents, nursing assistants, bus drivers. So you can see that these are um, some higher risk in, um, workers. Um, and then you can also see on the right are just the numbers of them. And so you can see the sheer numbers um, is quite different than the rate, but there are um, a really high number. And overall, out of all injuries in the workplace setting, um, more than 30%, so a third of them are related to musculoskeletal injuries. And so that is um, definitely something, one of the reasons why Jay and I work in this area is because it can have a big impact if we can prevent these injuries from happening. So they don't always happen just at work. Um, the previous slide is collected from the Bureau of Labor Statistics where we track all the injuries and fatalities um, in workplaces. But this is um, data from the CDC. Um, it's uh, affectionately we call whiskers. Um, they do track also um, what happens in the general population or the public health. So you can see um, falls and being struck by or against objects um, are related to many of in many of the injuries. But in that next column over, where you can see um, motor vehicle um, transportation. Um, uh, overexertion and poisoning are kind of next um, in line. And so overexertion is typically what musculoskeletal disorders are um, named um, in, in these types of data. And so you can see it, it, it's also a significant impact um, just in the general population. So we thought we would take you back just to basic anatomy. So when we're talking about musculoskeletal health, um, you can kind of understand the underlying principles and why we give the recommendations we give um, for preventing musculoskeletal injury. Um, so it does relate mostly to your soft tissues, but those soft tissues are really um, are what gives your skeletal system its framework and its support. 
so these are kind of busy, so bear with me. Um, but just so we are talking about the same things, your muscles, um, if you um, or, or what move and give the support to your skeletal system. When you stretch those muscles or overexert them or pull them, that is called a muscle strain or uh, yeah, a muscle strain. And so um, those muscles are attached to bones with your tendons. And so you've probably all heard of tendonitis. And so when those tendons also get overly stretched or um, overused, um, they become inflamed and that's what tendonitis is. Those are covered with what we call synovial fluid in a sheath and that sheath also can rub against the tendons um, and have and, and become inflamed and reduce the area for those tendons. And so um, you can also have a tear in a tendon. Um, and that is due to um, it being um, pulled and to the extent that it actually those fibers do tear and break. So you often also in musculoskeletal injuries think of wear and tear. Um, and so that's what you're trying to reduce the wear and tear um, of that. We also that synovial fluid also comes in 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 packets in, in what we call bursa, so little sacs. And those are in your joints and that helps some of the fluidity in your joints um, for moving. So that's kind of some of our um, basic information of how those are pulled together. So you also have um, ligaments that connect bone to bone. Um, so the tendons connect muscle to bone, but you also have connections and joints that are um, just um, ligaments. And so when a ligament is um, uh, pulled or overextended, um, you get what's called a strain. And so you may um, think of uh, your ankle, you have an ankle sprain and what happens when you um, move it too much and it, and it um, uh, then tears. Um, this also can happen um, not only in the ankle, but in your back, um, your uh, musculoskeletal, your spine system also connects um, in various ways um, with various ligaments. And you may also um, have sprain your back. You may have also um, heard of that. And so those are kind of some of the basic um, connections and, and how things work. Um, another area, um, it's not only um, the muscles, the tendons, or the ligaments, or um, the sheaths and bursa that we talk about, but we also talk about in ergonomics entrapment of nerves, because this is often what causes um, some of the pressure and then pain, and specifically when you compress nerves, um, that causes a lot of potentially um, transferred pain. And so um, typical areas, and here is a nice diagram of the back, which we're going to focus on a little bit, talking about back health. So here on the right is a picture from a side view of um, your spine. And so you have these natural curves. And so your cervical area is your neck. Um, and you have this nice slight curve there. And the thoracic region, which is kind of your upper back, um, you have um, a curve in the other direction. And then in your lumbar region, um, you have a curve um, back in the same as your cervical. So you can kind of feel in your low back and your neck um, is called the lordosis. So it curves in that direction um, towards the back. Um, and then the thoracic region is kyphosis because it goes the other direction. So in particular areas um, in vertebrae, um, here in the C1, C7, if you have any entrapment or compression of a nerve there, it is that cervical nerve. Um, you also can have um, in the this area um, kind of in the thoracic region for, to the T1, C5 to T1, any kind of um, nerve pressure there or compression would be the brachial plexus nerve. And then um, you also can have the same area, uh, another typical area is in the L5 S1, which is not listed here. Um, area, which is the lumbar region and the sciatic nerve. So you've heard of sciatica. 
Um, another area, so it's not only restricted to your back, is um, with your wrist and carpal tunnel syndrome. And so that deals um, in this small area of your wrist. And if that nerve becomes um, compressed, um, that is your median nerve. And so that is what will cause issues with your um, thumb and forefinger. So we also kind of wanted to share that a lot of ergonomics um, is related to cumulative trauma. So even though you have heard of, oh, I just bent down and then all of a sudden my back went out, it is truly not an acute event. It is something that has accumulated over time. And so we call it cumulative trauma. So as compared to this image on the left of a broken bone, an acute injury is something that does happen instantaneously. And like smoking and the development of cancer over time, that latency of a repeated exposure over time can lead to um, an illness um, and, or cancer in the case of smoking. So ergonomics is often something that does happen over time and it has to do with your exposure um, to the risk factors that relate to those soft tissue injuries. And so as we were talking about the muscles, tendons, ligaments, nerves, and other soft tissues can become injured over time. So what do we mean by these risk factors? So there's been many epidemiological studies and, and many look, looking into what has been related to various um, uh, of these uh, musculoskeletal injuries. And so um, we're providing a, a few lists, but there are much more um, risk factors related to it. So one is awkward posture. And what we mean by awkward posture is when you think about your body, almost every joint has its what we call neutral posture, meaning that um, it is not, um, it's in its natural state. And so when you think about um, the pose of just a body standing up, your wrist is neutral, um, your back has its natural curves, um, your knees are um, you know, slightly bent, your elbows slightly bent. Um, and so an awkward posture is anything deviating from that neutral posture. So bending, twisting, reaching, stooping, but also a static posture. So holding a posture for a long period of time, sitting for a long period of time might be related to it. Also heavy lifting, so the force. So something that um, uh, takes a lot of exertion um, is related to musculoskeletal injury. And then the other main factor is repetitive activities. So repetitive motion. These aren't the only risk factors. Um, for example, Jay does a lot of work with vibration. Vibration is also um, related to musculoskeletal injuries. Um, also, even stress um, is related to musculoskeletal injury, um, psychosocial stress. And so um, other factors are related, but these are the main um, factors that have been studied. Um, and risk also increases when you combine the risk factors. And so if you have an awkward posture, but you're also doing heavy lifting, um, that can increase the risk of injury. Risk also increases with the frequency, intensity, and duration of the exposure. So how often you're exposed, the level of the exposure, and then how long over time. As we mentioned, it's cumulative, so the number of years. So now Jay is going to jump in and he's going to share a little more detail about these risk factors and give you some examples. And then we'll finally wrap up with talking about things at home that you might be exposed to that you might want to consider. Thank you, Laurel. Yeah, so the Laurel just uh, went over basic uh, principles and the background uh, on the musculoskeletal health and the anatomy and uh, potential uh, potential risk factors, uh, well-known risk factors that are associated with musculoskeletal disorders. So let me start with the uh, neck posture because that's uh, the very uh, top part of our spine on our back. So the good neck posture is usually considered when your ears are positioned directly above the shoulders with the chest right wide open and shoulders back. And in this neutral posture, the stresses on your neck is usually minimized 
because the head weight is naturally balanced on the, on the top of the cervical spine. And in this case, the force on the mat would be very similar to just the mass of your head, which is on average about the 10 pounds, 10 to uh, 12 pounds on average. So as you bend your neck down, which is causing the head held forward in poor posture, the cervical spine must support increasing amount of weight. And one a good rule of thumb is that for every inch that you your head move forward in a, you know, that creates a pro posture, the additional 10 pounds of the weight is being applied onto your cervical spine. So as you can see from the figure uh, on the right side on the slide, the force on the neck is four times greater when the, your neck is bent for around the 30 degrees forward while you are uh, doing test texting or using the phone. And it could be up to six times of the head mass when your neck is bent around the 60 degrees. And this is a significant stress on your neck that can cause neck pain and strain. And the awkward back posture would be also considered the, when the back bending without support or ability to vary the postures for the extended periods. The back bending or forward flexion is measured in the reference to the vertical axis, as you can see from that figure at the center of the slide. The, when the back bent forward more than 30 degrees, and as you can see from the figure on the right side, the spine will experience the greater stress due to both greater compression on one side and tension on the other side. And uh, when we look at the upper extremity, especially for the uh, wrist, when the wrist is in an awkward posture, such as the wrist flexion, which is uh, your wrist is bending down of uh, extension and uh, bending up, and ulnar and radial deviation, which is your wrist motions uh, from side to side, these, can, these awkward uh, wrist postures can create intracorporeal pressure that can pinch the nerve, as uh, Laurel mentioned earlier, that go through the, you know, th that can pinch the nerve that goes through the uh, wrist, mainly the median nerve, uh, which create increased risk for the nerve disorders such as couple tunnel syndromes. When these awkward wrist postures are repeated or combined with other uh, physical risk factors such as uh, uh, high pinch or grip forces, as uh, Laura mentions, and these are risks for injuries for tendonitis or couple tunnel syndromes like uh, nerve disorders can significantly increase. So therefore you would like to uh, reduce those injuries, uh, reduce those awkward wrist postures. And also in, in terms of the lower extremity postures, kneeling and squatting are really common awkward postures um, in the workplaces. And they are associated with musculoskeletal disorders in the lower extremities. And similar to the awkward postures in other body parts that we have discussed so far, the awkward, the lower extremity postures can also increase the muscular loading and the biomechanical stresses on each of the joints in the upper extremities. So it, it is important to avoid any non-neutral postures at the work as well as a home to reduce the risk, risks for the musculoskeletal pain and injuries. In addition to these postures, right, and there is also another uh, risk factors that the Laurel introduced earlier. The heavy lifting is known to be associated with the low back pain and other musculoskeletal disorders, and uh, which frequently happens in our daily lives. The various standards and guidelines suggest that the lifting object weighing more than 70 pounds shouldn't be uh, lifted, uh, shouldn't be done more than once a day, or lift, lifting more than 55 pounds shouldn't be performed more than um, 10 times a day. So this means that the maximum lift one time, even though it's done, is done correctly, should not exceed 70 pounds and lifting 50 pounds with the correct posture cannot be repeated uh, 10 times um, in a day. So, and also hand, hand, high hand force, including pinching and gripping happen often, uh, we can see in the various uh, you know, workplaces or home settings, as you can see from the pictures 
on the slide. And those are also well-known risk factors that are associated with the upper extremity musculoskeletal disorders. And as mentioned earlier, when these forceful exertions at the hands are combined, the risks can substantially increase. The last musculoskeletal disorder related risk factors that I'm covering today is repetitive motion, which is defined as using the same motion with a little or no variation every few seconds for prolonged periods. When you are typing on a keyboard on average typing speed of 40 words per minute, and typing for a couple of hours can result in the somewhere between 14,000 to 20,000 finger movements, which is extremely repetitive. And also the video on the slide showing the actual commercial of Dungeons Craft fishing activities, which uh, Laurel and I have been uh, working on uh, lately. And also the video on the slide is showing the actual, uh, you know, these activities, you know, they average crab pot weight so around a couple of hundred pounds. And they usually pull these uh, pots up to uh, from anywhere between 100 to 1,000 pots a day. And this is highly repetitive motion and combined with the first of exertions can actually result in, of, in overuse of your soft tissues, including tendons and ligaments and uh, your muscles. And that relates to the pain and injuries in your musculoskeletal systems. So based upon those risk factors, now we have looked at those very various risk factors affecting our musculoskeletal health. Then how can we keep our musculoskeletal systems healthy and save our back at home? So as Laurel shows you about the spine curvature, we have a lordosis and the uh, kyphosis, and ideally our spine should have a curve as shown on the very uh, left slide uh, where a person is standing. This is called a rhodosis. This is what you like to see from the lumbar reason. However, with you know, seated posture, you can lose this nice uh, spine curvature, or rather this curvature can be uh, you know, so flipped. As you can see from this seating posture, this creates uneven pressure on the discs. So you know, when you sit, please have your sit back angle between uh, 100 to 110 degrees so that you can reduce those excessive pelvis flexion, which is kyphosis. And uh, also you can you know, alternate the sit and stand to reduce the time with the excessive uh, pressure on the spine due to this uh, you know, to, you know, extreme the kyphosis on the lumbar region. And this figure shows a relative spine load in the different postures. Suppose that spine load is about 100% while standing and the load while laying on the bed is less than half of that standing, and which makes sense because there is no compression due to the gravity. And when you sit right up with a relatively, uh, you know, something called better posture for the sitting, the load can be can increase uh, up to fifty percent. However, when you sit with a poor awkward postures, then the stress on the spine can be as twice as much. So when you drive, please avoid those hunched posture and the recommended, uh, you know, and the recommended sit back angles to reduce those uh, uh, spine stresses are between 115 degrees. So as we discussed earlier, the awkward postures while you're using phone, laptop, and computers, any mobile device can significantly increase the stress on your neck due to uh, you know, excessive neck flexion. So please, you know, if, you, if possible, place your screen at your eye level or within 15 degrees below to avoid any neck strains. And one example, one would argue that if I hold my phone up here, then what about uh, my shoulder is hurting so much then, you know, providing those, you know, uh, arm or shoulder supports as uh, shown on the slide can also further reduce the shoulder strain while you are holding up your screens. So now, um, uh, the Laurel will be conclude our uh, you know so, sort of presentations by um, sharing more examples that can um, you know you can benefit from uh, her advice on house chores. 
Yeah, and we're going to wrap this up pretty quickly so we can get to your classic questions. But we did want to add in a little bit since we talked about all the various risk factors that even when you're doing various chore activities, I know a lot of us are doing way more gardening or moving um, mulch from our driveway into place. And so really think about your postures while you're doing it. and. And these examples show some um, here on the left, um, even some uh, changes in the tools. We talked about it's the interaction with the tool and the environment and the task. And so this task is kind of raking, but if you add a handle to the rake, um, you can see how you may be able to have a better posture um, because you've, um, you're using a tool that allows you to have a different grip on it. Um, also consider um, the contact. Um, if you are kneeling for a long period of time, putting something that's cushioning that's not pressing on um, the soft tissue or the tissues on your um, joints, um, that can also help um, with that. Um, also just consider like if you're having to do something um, for a period of time and you would have to bend down to say ground level, um, create yourself a way to sit and do that. Um, I even do this with my laundry because I have front load launders. And so when I'm moving from the washer to the dryer, I just sit on the floor and do it rather than bend down for a long period of time to sort um, through the laundry. Um, and also just thinking about um, vacuuming even and um, your posture as you're doing that. Um, and even, you know, when you're lifting, um, we call this kind of body mechanics, which is not um, the ideal way to prevent an injury. So if you do have to lift, um, ensure that you are aware of keeping, maintaining the neutral spine, the curves in your spine and not hunching over as he's talked about before um, is very important or can help um, with reducing. But of course, as Jay mentioned, there are limits. We all have limits to our um, ability and the, the strength that we have and so you don't um, even if you're using a good posture but if you're exceeding what your limit is for lifting you're still going to have an injury so just be very aware of what you're lifting and consider ways to reduce that load or share the load so we're just going to leave you with this kind of basic principles of ergonomics and you can um, look up this ref reference if you like but it boils down to 10 things. Um, I think we've mentioned this multiple times, work in a neutral posture, reduce the force you have to use by um, lightening the load, um, keep everything within easy reach. If it's within easy reach, you won't get an awkward posture to have to reach for it. Um, work at proper heights, um, reduce excessive motions, um, minimize fatigue and static load. As we mentioned, if you're in the same posture for a long period of time, um, that can introduce fatigue. Your body likes to move around. Minimize pressure points. As we talked about, um, the pressure points um, of your knees if you're kneeling, of your elbows if you're using armrests, of your wrists on hard surfaces. Um, provide clearance. Make sure that um, your knees can fit under and, and such. Um, and the last one, move, exercise, and stretch. And so it is part of, as we mentioned, uh, your body doesn't like to be in a one position. And so be sure to move around. And obviously, um, if you stay fit or um, and do exercise, but again, within your limits, um, you're increasing um, your muscle strength and your muscle stability. Um, and then just maintain a comfortable environment. We didn't really talk about that, but excessive heat and excessive cold can also impact musculoskeletal health and increase the risk factors. So I think that is all we have prepared and we um, can go to questions and hopefully um, there's some good questions. You all, that was fantastic. And I found myself uh, trying to move into neutral positions while you were talking. <laughs> Everyone was sitting up more straight. Yeah, um, the one simple question in the um, sitting in your chair, Jay, it almost looked like in that image, like you're leaning back a little. Is that, is yeah. that right? Yes, so basically it's, you know, it's, I think you know, it's, uh, in all the sort of uh, the, so, 
outdated the recommendations was like you need to sit upright up. I mean, sit upright so with the 90 degrees angles on your back, but that's uh, uh, not true. And based upon the biomechanical um, you know, studies and showing that uh, that's, uh, you know, excessive pelvis rotation from the 90 degrees back angles can create uh, um, uh, excessive uh, pressure on the spine. So you would like to open that up. So basically based, you know, I think this uh, study was done in a, um, the minimal gravity where when you are you know, exposed to zero gravity and you're, uh, you know, those, your uh, the soft tissues uh, will, you know, so will be go to that the natural curve curvatures. And that's when the, that's, you know, angles between your thigh and low back is about 135 degrees. So based upon, you know, the extensive biomechanical studies, they have shown that uh, having the low back angle about on 100, between 100 and 110, that would all uh, reduce those uh, stresses on the low back uh, significantly as compared to sitting really right up at the 90 degrees. And if you sit up at the 90 degrees angle, basically you are not taking fully ad taking advantage of those lumbar supports and the back support of your chair. Hey, it's revolutionary. As <laughs> I said, I mean, at the beginning, I was like, I really don't know much about any of this. And, um, you know, the number of times that I've complained to my massage therapist about my um, mouse hand, like, you know, after spending a lot of time writing. Um, so thank you for that. So for our listeners, 110, 115 degrees rather than 90, if we're sitting up at our computers. Fantastic. Um, we are getting some questions um, coming in uh, from our uh, listeners. And so I want to make sure I cover those first. Um, and one person is saying, can you post or email us your list of recommendations and we'll get permission to share uh, some of what you've put together. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Great. Yes. Um, and, and look for an email from Casey Farm uh, who introduced uh, the session today uh, as follow-up. Uh, thank you for that question. And here's another one. Could you say more about the link with physiological and psychosocial stress, please. Sure, do you want to take that, Jay, or do you want me to take that? Yeah, you can go ahead and you know, I can add it after, you know, if I find something. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, but when you really think about it, I mean, think about the times you're stressed, and I know I do this myself. If I'm stressed, it's I can feel my muscles just tensing up and my shoulders raising, and so I think you even um, maybe can identify with that under stressful times it is linked to how your muscles react. And so some studies have looked at various like lifting activities and looked at how a stressor, somebody like yelling at you to, you know, do it correctly and stuff. And just that tensing up um, actually did um, raise their risk of injury from the biomechanical measures that they measure. So they can actually measure the impact of stress um, on on the the back and 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 lifting and things like that, and so I think um, you know that's the most simple explanation of it is just that it does um, your stress reactions. One of the reactions is how your muscles um, you know tense up and everything. But Jay, I don't know if you have a better explanation. Yeah, I think you know I don't know if I will have a better explanation than you. But I think if I would like to add on, and also when you you know are under the stress, and there are some stress hormones like cortisols, there are you know the, you know those uh, physiological and biological studies have shown that those uh, stress hormones can also regulate and make uh, you know mediate all those processes that actually resulted in these, uh, you know, musculoskeletal stresses and, you know, also, you know, facilitate those, uh, you know, the fatigue processes. So that also can, you know, also scientifically improve that, you know, and, uh, at, you know, it's ironically, when the Laurel mentioned that, uh, you know, when you are under the stress, uh, you know, we tend to short, you know, short our shoulders. And there are so many extensive studies that actually uh, try to link those stresses to the trapezius muscles that are actually, you know, mainly a response for the shoulder shrug. And because there are so much studies on the stresses and the most, um, and the 
uh, muscle activities on the trapezius muscle. And if you go to Northern Europe, there are people, or people who are studying and they call themselves as a trapezist. Wow. Um, I, my yoga teacher would say, you know, if you're wearing your shoulders as earrings. <laughs> exactly. Right? Um, let that go. <laughs> yeah, right. Speaking of, I have, to, I have to admit, as you all were talking about awkward postures, I was relating to myself, can we please talk about yoga? Yoga is 100% awkward postures. What, um, help me make that connection or figure that out. That out. That's why I said, you know, one of the things is to stay in shape, but you do have to be conscious of um, some of the exercise that is out there. Um, yoga, though, typically is um, you do hold some postures um, in yoga, depending on the type of yoga that you do, but typically it is not for an extended period of time and it does increase um, in the joints stability and um, your body, I mean, our human, our bodies are amazing. They are designed um, with kind of um, like guy wires. When you think of a mast and all the different wires that keep it upright, our spine has all of this musculature um, all around it. And it's that muscle balance. And I think practices like yoga, um, Pilates and stuff, it does work on that muscle balance. And it's not only with your spine, it's all your joints. It is really just this myriad of all of the structure, which is the muscles, the ligaments and the tendons, all these soft tissues. And by using those, um, you're really helping to, to support and to build on it, but it can go too far. And so you're looking for that sweet spot that the body likes motion, the body likes movement, the body likes exercise but it's just keeping it in, in check and um, maybe not doing, overdoing it when you're doing some of the stretches, reaching your toes and, um, <laughs> and some of the go within your ability and build up to it so that you're not um, overextending or over um, exerting yourself. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah, I think this is the this is the the point where we mentioned that that yoga in the tradition is about where your mind is in the poses and where what your breath is doing in the poses, right? And not about really turning yourself into a pretzel. Jay, it's, I'm afraid, I'm yeah. afraid I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, no. So I, I was just going to say, I think I, because, uh, you know, so, you know, Lola was saying that so, doing too much is bad is, uh, you know, my wife was a good example. She was so ambitious when she was uh, taking the hot yoga classes and she sprained her back uh, from, uh, you know, being ambitious. But I think you know, so, you know, Laurel's response was great. If I would like to add just uh, two more cents onto her response. So many of our connective tissues like ligaments and tendons are, and also including uh, intervertebral discs, and those are avascular, meaning that there is a limited blood supplies. And the only way for those soft tissues to uh, remain healthy is through the diffusion which is only happening through the uh, body movement. That's why Laurel said our body likes movements and that's those movements create. So walking, jogging, stretching also, you know, to help our soft tissues remain healthy through those nutrition and actions can be supplied to, to into those soft tissues. And for, you know, because I'm engineer and if we like to look at our soft tissues as a tensile strength, uh, you know, to standpoints, having those greater flexibility. For example, if you have a really steel wire and if you pull it, you're gonna break it. But if you have an elastic lower band, then even though you stretch it, you're not going to break it, right? So basically because our tendons works as a pulley in the mechanical lever system, as you, you know, build the flexibility on your tendons so through the yoga can actually help you to increase the, not only the tensile strength, but also, you know, push that, so, you know, your um, sort of the limit of the soft tissue, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the strength. So that's, uh, that's why the yoga is really good exercise. Uh, I'm so glad I asked my um, potentially awkward question. Um, it's really helpful. Um, we've got another sort of into the details question uh, in from one of our viewers. Uh, this is uh, from Carmen for Jay. 
you said leaning back 100 to 110 degrees when sitting is optimal. Is leaning forward 10 to 20 degrees from 90 also optimal? So it's uh, I I think uh, the, I I said it's a better. I think if I uh, have said uh, it's optimal, you know, excuse me, uh, you know, I think that there is no optimal postures, and uh, we all say the your best posture is your next posture. You always would like to move around and change your posture, but I think the uh, you know, short answer to the question is uh, leaning forward is always bad for your back. So that's the bottom line. So whenever you're possible. You know, you know, if you cannot make a 100 uh, to 100 degrees, maybe you can make it like, you know, 95, you know, it's maybe no, no more than 90 degrees. So it's like a, a bending forward is always bad, bad for your back. So if you, you think about it, I think our torsos, so um, from our waist where you're actually, where you're bending at that L5 S1 of your spine, I think is, um, you could correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, but it's like a huge percentage of your body weight. It's 65% or something of your body weight. And so when you think about how much you weigh, and then you take 65% of that, whenever you're bending forward, what we call it a moment arm. So from that point in your low back, the longer the distance is out is actually is increasing the weight that is being supported at that point, which is your low back. So you're just any time you're leaning forward, you're, you're really um, uh, stressing that. So I think also the other thing to point out, you it is okay. I mean, we obviously can lean forward, but also it's the support. If you're able to actually um, use your arms or something to bear the weight, they call it like, uh, or counter level, like you've seen like the golfers pick up a golf ball. They'll use one leg um, in the back, um, raise their leg in the back and bend forward. So that's acting as a counterweight. And so the weight of their leg in the back helps counter their um, torso going forward. So it's using like a counterbalance. So there are ways, there are ways, it's like you, it's not like you should never bend forward, yeah. but just think about how you can support yourself if you do have to bend forward to pick up something. You can put your hand on a counter or a hand on something to lean forward or use that counterbalance lift your lift one leg back and and see the difference of what you feel in your low back yeah yeah exactly and also just uh, to add that so it's uh, supposed that your uh, you know spine you know looks uh, you know a here uh, i don't know if you can see my screen here you know so uh, when you are you know some um, sitting against uh, your low, uh, the back support about 100 degrees and suppose that your you know, spine interbrate, vertebrae disc is looks like this, right? Now, however, if you lean forward and your spine is going to look like this, so that's why it's, you know, leaning forward is bad. But as uh, Laura mentioned that if your body is being supported and that's a different story because those compression tension can be you know, alleviated, alleviated by those supports. And one thing while you have this up, since <clears throat> I think we have just one moment to describe what those discs actually look like. Um, you have the nucleus of the disc, which is like really jello in the middle, but you can see here on the image, um, the around the nucleus are fibers that go up and down. And so they actually kind of look like this. And that's why we can take compressive um, force. It's very strong. And that's why heavy weight lifters, you can see they always keep a neutral spine, but they can lift an amazing amount of weight. And that's because your spine can take a lot of compressive force. And the issue is when it's not in neutral, when it's brought out of it, it's pushing that nucleus out. And that's when somebody says they have a bulging disc or something. That is when that nucleus pops out. It, it puts so much force against the back and destroys that the infrastructure, that tissue around it, and then it will pop out. And then that's what then impinges on nerves um, or the vertebrae on top of vertebrae if it goes all the way out. And it changes over time. You have um, the other thing I was going to mention is there's a certain hydration to the to the discs, and so as we age, you lose a little bit of that hydration, and you you hear people say they've shrunk with age, and that's because of the discs. 
starting to kind of come together because they don't hydrate. The tissue isn't as youthful maybe as, as it was. Um, and you also, when you're laying down at night, it does tend to regain its hydration. And that's why often in the morning when you wake up, you're like, oh, I'm kind of stiff um, because they're fully hydrated. And so all the surrounding tissues are like, oh, this feels a little bit different because I, there's a little more space now in all my discs now that I'm fully hydrated and why it takes about 15, 20 minutes for you to get back to your normal, usual day, daytime spine um, functioning. Fantastic. Um, I, I have a couple more questions. I'm mindful of time. So maybe some of these could be could be rapid fire. We'll see, right? So that we get to all of them. Um, here's one about shoes, um, footwear. We think a lot about footwear. Um, particularly, I'm thinking about what a lot of us do, um, not fishermen, but those of us standing um, at home, standing in front of our desks. Um, are, is footwear a good investment? Thinking about orthotics and all of the ways that you can have fancier footwear. Say a little bit about that. I'll let you go, Jay. Sure. I think we, we should have, uh, we, we have a better a person to answer that uh, from uh, Cascade Campus who have you know, uh, done study with the Nikes. But I think it's, uh, there is always trade-off, and if uh, I would say it's a good investment, at the same time, you know, there is always trade-off between uh, you know observing those impacts and then provide those cushions versus uh, your, you know, stability. It's a balance. So if you have too much cushion, and it may help you to alleviate the, those pressures, but at the same time, it'll provide. Uh, you know, it's a greater instability of your uh, body. So I think uh, it's really depending upon your needs. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, if I were you, I wouldn't spend, you know, a couple of hundred dollars on your shoes. Rather, I will move around. But that thing, you know, it's every like once in a while, maybe uh, 20, 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be extended for walk. Just, you know, so 15 seconds of the just stretching and just, uh, you, know, you know, walking around your room would be sufficient. Um, you know, investment on your time. That is you. So you've answered um, a question that I had not yet asked, which was how frequently should we move around? And you said every. That's, uh, that's you know that that's you know that that's uh, I you know I that shouldn't be considered as a scientifically validated uh, you know suggestions, but. Uh, of course, uh, you know, moving around, uh, you know, frequently with the micro break would be great. But so I think uh, for, you know, based upon the literature, it would be anywhere between 20 minutes. It can be, you know, up to 60 minutes. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is no definite right or wrong answers. But uh, please do whenever you can. It sounds like we should really schedule 30 minute meetings to hit that <laughs> sweet spot and walk around for five minutes before we... Um, that's totally unscientific from the person who knows nothing. And I well, it doesn't is. have to be, yeah, so five minutes, it could be as short as 10 seconds or 20 seconds. Okay. <laughs> and I think that's what we all miss about uh, going from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting. We don't get to walk a few minutes from one meeting to another. Exactly. Right. right. We're going to all be doing extra laps of the, of, the, of the quad in front of the MU, I think, when mm -hmm. we're back on campus. The Speaking freedom. Of of when to change and move around. What about driving? Do we have any guidance at all about when it's time to stop doing that and start um, take a stretch break? Why do you need to take a break if you are sitting and driving? <laughs> I'm just, uh, you know, it's a suspicious. So, but uh, there are, for the professional drivers, there are, you know, so there is a regulation. Uh, you know, every uh, two hours and a half, they need to take a break. But um, I think like, you know, we, we can you know, use the same, you know, same sort of approaches. I think uh, having a break every couple of hours would be a good um, thing to do. But uh, Laurel may have uh, also a different answer. No, I think you know, you're obviously trying to get somewhere, so you can't take a break every 15 yeah. minutes and stretch mm -hmm. around. Yeah. But even shifting your posture as you're seated um, within safe reasons um, is always helpful because um, any like uh, Jay mentioned just micro breaks can really be effective and so even if you can't fully stand up um, and flex just moving your 
shifting your hips or your um, upper body and rotating your shoulders can um, make a big difference. Um, but definitely take breaks for also your vigilance and driving safety. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, we've got five minutes to the top of the hour and I know we have some sort of closing messages from Casey who'll also give us a report on follow-up. Do you all have any last words of wisdom or um, advice for us viewers on how to keep safe and healthy at home? Well, the one thing I want to just bring you back to the beginning of the talk when we talked about how this is cumulative trauma. And so just always keep that in mind. We have our bodies for our entire lives. And um, so take care of it and consider when you're doing a task or something, think about how you might be able to change the posture or change um, how you're doing it um, in a way that maybe reduces some of these risks that we've talked about because it does accumulate over time. And we all want to be healthy, um, older adults and still being able to walk and to do all the things um, with our grandkids <laughs> that we, we want to do. So that's our goal is to, to keep everyone healthy. Sure. Thank you, Laurel. Jay, any Yeah, else? so I, I think you know, so the, my comment, final comment would be very related to what uh, Laurel said. Uh, you know, so it, it is cumulative trauma and it is a, a adverse health outcomes that actually can be you know, medically diagnosed. And oftentimes, so when we feel numbness and tinklings and sore on our wrist, we don't take a day off. But if you, you, know, so if you sprain your ankle, you may. But so the a bottom line is if you feel something, you need to seek for you know, the help. And also you need to seek for you know, either personal or you know, the personal intervention could be you know, as simple as you know, changing your mouth with, you know, from the right to left. And uh, those kind of uh, you know, smaller changes can make uh, your musculoskeletal health really you know, so, you know, so healthy. So, you know, so the bottom line is so if you feel something, you should say something and should uh, seek for help. Otherwise, if you keep ignoring and there is a, uh, you know, the point where your condition is going to be irreversible. So, you know, all the detection and all the uh, reporting as well as uh, all the intervention is always key to keep your musculoskeletal health healthy. You all are great. You've um, you've been so helpful um, to all of us. Uh, I thank you so much for being here today and for the work that you do to promote well-being, health, and well-being across so many different populations. We appreciate it. You're very thank welcome. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having us. Over to you, Casey. Thanks, Allison. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Jay. I uh, really, really appreciate it. I just want to let the audience know that I'll send out that email tomorrow, so be on the lookout for it. So I'll get the list of recommendations from Laurel and Jay, and so I'll make sure that email is in your inbox uh, tomorrow, viewers. So make sure you pick that up. Um, thank you to you, uh, the audience, for your participation, and to our panelists. You know, Laurel, Jay, again, for your insight and expertise. You know, around environmental. And, and health just around the home and ergonomics. It's absolutely fascinating. Something that I think um, we don't think about too often, but has a, a pretty significant impact in our lives. So I really appreciate uh, your time today. Thank you.